you were like a standby commando. So your kit was all packed, three hours notice to move kind of thing. If you see it, an IRA patrol, take him out. If you see a, a loyalist, it's up to you. It's in a 100% Republican area. James, how are you, brother? Good, Chris. Yeah, very good. So, James, I'm going to read yeah, off your good. Amazon page because it will do you more credit than, <laughs> than, than my bad memory will do. But <laughs> okay, mate. James Emac, born in Scotland, spent much of his time, uh, much of his childhood abroad, gaining a love of nature, the outdoors and wildlife. He became a commando in the late 80s. It's the same as me. And a member of a special operations unit with a 22 year career serving in many of the world's troubled hotspots. James subsequently specialized as a counterterrorism advisor and assisted in capacity building operations in support of UK and US government initiatives. His passion for wildlife led James to assist in the development of counter poaching programs in Africa. This passion remains and James spends much of his leisure time photographing the very animals he strives to protect. Wow. Great stuff, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not too shabby when you hear it read out by someone yes. else. <laughs> yes. Should we start at the beginning? When, when, when did you join the Marines? So I joined in 1988, October 1988, Chris. Um, I think I did my PRC, the Potential Recruits course, in the summer. So I only had a couple of months to wait, really, before joining up. What was um, – uh, that sounds right about my time. What I joined in June – I think it was June '88. Okay. I was 558. Five, Were you around that? 563, mate. Oh, a bit before oh, yeah. me. Yeah, so yes. It's, yeah, yeah. Not, not, what would we be? A few trips apart then, really? Yeah. You guys had it quite tough, didn't you? Um, I don't know. I think I had a really good training team. I'll say that from the off. I, okay. I did hear some horror stories about training teams, and probably like yourself, when you're at you know, CTC at Limston, you'll see other troops getting absolutely thrashed or fracked. <laughs> Yeah, and nah, it sucks to be those guys. Yeah, I mean, we got all the thrashing, but our train team, were, uh, you could just say they were quite nice. They wanted the best for us because they saw some of the other troops and they were getting smashed down to like six originals from 55, yeah. you know, 55 recruits. And God, you just felt so, you just, it just felt sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I always remember, and it's an example I've just carried with the rest of my life, but there was a, a team, um, a troop in the accommodation block across from us. And I can remember one day, two of their guys being like 30 seconds late to fall in and their troop sergeant put them in the crash Superman position. So legs spread, arms behind the back, and then leaning on their foreheads on the concrete for the remainder of the 45 minutes to be late. And then, of course, when they stood up to try and run, they just fainted and collapsed. <laughs> and, you know, where they were like 20 press-ups, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Funny times. Funny times. What was your – did you have a nemesis in training? My, mine was probably the endurance course. Um, not so much. I think I found training pretty easy early on. But as it went on, I think because I was a skinny little runt, I, you know, I found it really hard. The speed marches, the weights, everything like that. I just – you know, I, I got through it, but I scraped through it. There's no two ways about that. Yeah, I think you and me both, mate. <laughs> but then again, they say it's not meant to be easy for anyone, is it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's going to find your weak point, yes. Um, went to a unit? Yeah, so my first unit was was up here in Scotland, 4-5 Commando. Um, and even before I arrived, you know, my, my PTI, my DL, you know, good guys, they were saying, oh, you love it up there, it's wild. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're recruiting what does wild mean? Jeez. But yeah, I, I came up in, I adored it. Loved the unit. Thought it was an amazing place. 
Yeah, and you're closer to home for you, of course. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, I think um, I arrived, what did I arrive in the summer? So back then, what did they used to call it? You were like a standby commando. So your kit was all packed, three hours notice to move kind of thing. Mm. And Tiananmen Square kicked off and we were convinced we were going to go there, <laughs> you know, and a few other things. But yeah, we went straight into like, you know, autumn for the mountain training, then to Norway, uh, and then the beat up for Northern Ireland, then out to South Armagh. So it was a terrific time to, to, to join the unit as well. Mm. I heard a story once. I don't know if they were nods in training. I think that's what I was told, but they had their, it was something like they'd got their Arctic thermals and they painted tank tracks over them. And they, they'd gone ashore uh, as a, as a, as a Channam and square run ashore. <laughs> and apparently it was the first time in history. They had to get the MPs to, <laughs> or the military police to go and rescue them. Cause <laughs> that's like, <laughs> I, I won't, I won't name the individual on camera, mate, but I know the guy who did it at four or five commando. Yeah. yeah. He basically got a BV, you know, the track vehicle to run over um, some white cotton pajamas he'd found from somewhere and, you know, had some little broken glasses he put on. And yeah, I know the guy very well, uh, lives in Spain at the moment, but yeah, he did that, went ashore and it wasn't well received. <laughs> no, no, no. I remember we, uh, we went ashore one night in Pompey and two of the lads dressed up as Hitler and people were like literally chasing you down. <laughs> A, 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 it was actually a German tourist. Go, this is very wrong. <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah, you know you're going to find them. <laughs> yeah, that's probably my best Austrian accent there. But hey, actually, probably more appropriate being Austrian. Yes, did you go over the water with four or five? Yes, I did, mate. It was a very good tour, and um, I was quite fortunate to go. Um, we'd been all warned off, all as or sprogs as younger guys, that um, the CEO. Uh, he really wanted an experienced, you know, unit to go out. So we were pretty much told as Sprogs, forget it. You'll be rear party. You'll stay back at base and look after camp. And as you know, Chris, that's heartbreaking. That is just not what you want. So we just begged, borrowed. We'd go with anyone. Um, so I was ex-company at the time. Um, and I had a really, really terrific troop sergeant. And he made sure I got in the orbit and got to go out. So very, very fortunate because, you know, a lot of us were split up and some of us didn't get to go, but it was a terrific tour, really busy. Um, trying to think now, yeah, there was sort of two or three main incidents where the guys, you know, acquitted themselves really, really well. And of course, we came back without a fatality, which, as our CEO always said, you know, that is the, the benchmark of a successful tour. Yes, I can speak from experience. Things get very, very real when you one of your mates gets shot dead in the first bloody month. Yeah. Um, yes. I think at that moment, you, you, it makes you realize what you signed up for. I think it was a, I mean, you can look back with hindsight, but I mean, I remember even at the time being slightly surprised by it all that we were soldiers doing in effect a policeman's job, but in a, war that wasn't a war it was just the oddest thing ever and I also didn't even as a young marine didn't appreciate this kind of slope shoulders of guys if you shoot someone it's up to you you know that that whole backup of your chain of command kind of saying well you've got your yellow card uh, your white card or whatever shoot someone it's up to you and I remember a lot of the older guys being really reluctant to to fire the weapons because of that they would say you know take it on your own shoulders but it was an odd an odd time great too great guys but just an odd situation if that makes sense i'd say it was pretty um pretty loaded on one side can we say that yeah 100 percent. you yeah. know i remember going out on patrol one night we'd gone to a new area and it was a little bit rural and i remember the the brief we got was right folks if you see a an ira patrol take them out if you see a, a loyalist, it's up to you, right? <laughs> it's, it's, I'm just saying it because I'm all for peace and love and kindness <laughs> and empathy the, these days, James, and, yeah. and, 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 and uh, what do you call it? Reconciliation, you know? But um, it, what, you know, some things that <laughs> went, oh, I'm spitting now. Some things that went on over there were, um, yeah, best left in the past, I think. 
I think so, my friend. I think it was a very, uh, very strange, strange time. And I, and I think the legacy of it proves that, you know, the fact you've got like 70 year old veterans being recalled to answer the crimes that were investigated before and no new evidence has arrived. You're like, it's just a, a real t- shitty situation. Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. That I spoke with Robin Horsfall about that because mm. he's he's obviously been um, quite galvanising in in leading the the campaign against the Northern Ireland prosecutions. And he just said, "What use?" Because my thing was, like, if someone shot my kid unfairly, I I'd fucking hunt them down for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, yeah, you'd, yeah, you'd never let it lie. Yeah. But Robin said, "Well, a lot, uh, but, but these cases have all have all been to court." Um, does make you question, though, the fairness of the the ju- do we call it the judicial? Yeah, you know, because it was a, you know, it was it. Ah, moving on. So, w- were you in South Omar? I was in South Omar. Yeah, yeah. They, what well, they called that band bandit country, didn't they? Yeah, and it was very well named. I mean, um, the the South Armai IRA Battalion, they had a very, very well-earned reputation for effective operations, you know. And I think in later years, even a lot of the, what you call it, international operations, where it was mainland targets, were outsourced to South Armai Provisional IRA. So it shows you the effect that and the, the capability they had, not just within Northern Ireland or their own home turf, but actually exporting it to, to other areas. Mm. And I think in our time, there was the, the famous gun team was out about the, the big Dushka 12.7 running around, you know, that would take down helicopters. And I think they did shoot down a Lynx at some point. And they had the armoured car that would sort of pop across the border and attack the vehicle checkpoints and stuff like that. So there was quite a lot going on, yeah. Yeah, one of my oppos was telling me that he said, when you're on patrol down there, you'd look at road, road signs and he said they're the massive. <laughs> he said they're a massive hole through them where the was it a, a Garant? Am I remembering that right? A Garand, yeah, the big big rifle, yeah. Garand, like a long, a, a really heavy caliber sniper rifle, and that there was a guy running loose with one of those. Uh, for yeah, a while. yeah, I think that was the Barrett, the big fifty cal Barrett. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think yeah. the troop. I think they grabbed him late nineties. Was it? Something like that. They got him, yeah. And again, that was another member of the South Armour team. They they had a sniper team trained and pretty effective on that weapon. So that was another thing everybody was hunting for was this big fifty caliber. I and mean, you're <laughs> plodding around in your Gore-Tex and, you know, your helmet sort of wobbling up and down everywhere. And you're thinking about these big weapons out there, yeah. Yeah. Can you give us an idea, James, of any incidents you're involved in, just so our friends at home can... Yeah, so I mean, um, we had quite a few, but I suppose the one people would know more about was um, I'd, I wasn't on the ground when the guys did it, but we, we went out straight away to support. And it was the, um, the Carragher brothers. So there were IRA members. One, I believe at the time, was on the run. And just by sheer chance, our guys stopped them at a VCP. Um, saw weapons in the car, car took off, guys chased after it. One of our guys ended up on the bonnet hanging out the windscreen like some of a Liam Neeson movie as it went along. But um, as the vehicle went through the gears, gathered speed, it was inevitable he was going to be seriously hurt or killed. So the section commander gave a proper fire control order, him and a Marine opened fire and brought it to a halt sort of thing. Um, and I think one of the brothers was killed outright. The other one was seriously injured. Mm. So as a result of that, on the ground, we were sort of putting up the, the cordons and stuff. So the mood's very high. It's very tense. It's in a 100% Republican area. So that night, um, we're all sort of securing the scene for SOCO, scene of crimes and that to uh, investigate. Um, and the sentry position I was looking at was looking over a graveyard at the time. And it was like, it was like something from a, a, a movie. The fog had rolled in, and you know, a 20-odd-year-old young Marine, I'm lying on my stomach, and I just see just movement between the gravestones, I'm kind of looking and I, you know, get my suicide side up and I look again. And this time I can see someone carrying and ducking behind it. So I, I click on the radio and I can get a headquarters and I'm saying, look, I, I think I've got a gunman and you can, I can imagine the chaos <laughs> back at headquarters. And I keep seeing this guy dodging 
between gravestones and he's, you know, I can see he's carrying. So I'm trying to wake the guys behind me to let them know, but he's close enough. I don't want him to hear me. And as a young Marine, it's the first time I'd experienced this where, okay, you're on your own now. You need to decide to shoot or not shoot. And of course, and in the, you know, the ears, the headset, I've got HQ going, well, what? and I just came out and said, okay, stand by for contact. I thought, I've, I've got to take this guy out. I don't know how many more there are. So, you know, I lifted up the weapon and it's your training kicks in, even with the adrenaline and fear I had, clicked the safe to catch up, looked up and I just gave pause. I could see sort of the top half of him as he came between a couple of the tombstones. And then as he staggered out, I just put the safety on, swore because he was drunk and he had two rolls of wallpaper and he was cutting a shortcut. He must have been taking a shortcut. There was a bar from the bar to wherever the hell he lived. And now he was maybe 20 feet from me. So out of the mist and the dark, and I could see him clearly. And, you know, I got up, shouted, I mean, nearly fainted in fear. <laughs> I nearly, you know, wrenched his head off. But, you know, but now the guys are up. But I always remember that when people talk about, you know, squatty shoot to kill and everything. I thought, well, you know, there, there was a chance I had. And it was a very, for a young Marina, a, a big decision to make. Um, but all the tensions of the day, the adrenaline, what the guys had just gone through. But yeah, just some drunk guy trying to stagger home with two rolls of wallpaper in his hand. <laughs> so a funny story more than anything else. But that reminds me so much. We stopped a guy, I can't even remember what road it was, New Lodge Road or something. And uh and I said to him, Could you get out of the van, sir, and open the back for me, please? And he 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 you could see he didn't want to do it. And so I asked him again and he 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 just got he just like you could just see something was wrong and he opened the back and there was a there was a sheet like a bed sheet o over something in the back and i said could you take the sheet off sir please and and he just looked at me and he pulled a sheet there was a mortar base plate there <laughs> right you know the homemade no mortar wonder, tubes yeah. right and so i cocked my weapon and asked it, and 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 I, I can't I can't remember, you know, whatever it was. Get down, and he gets down, and he says, "I can explain, I can explain." And I shouted over to the, uh, I shouted over to our our brick commander, and uh, I won't say his name, but you know, Smudge, get over here. And he was he was chatting to another player at the at, or a player at the time, and he looked over his shoulder and went. Oh yeah, why? Have you found a mortar base plate? I went, yeah. And his face dropped and he come running over. And um the guy went, I'm a firework display guy. <laughs> and it was he's honestly, it's fireworks. And it and it was true, it was fire. You know, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm misleading people, <laughs> but on purpose because that's what it looked like. It was yeah. these black tubes, everything that you've been trained. Um, <laughs> gosh, yes, yes. The guy must have been absolutely bricking it as soon as he. Yeah, was he had some paperwork on it. You know, he had some paperwork about his business, <laughs> and it was fine. It was absolutely fine, but it was uh, yes. So, James, how did you move on? Um, what else did you do in the Corps before you went on to special operations? Um, Northern Iraq. Um, went out there with Op Haven, uh, pretty much straight from South Armagh, actually. I think a friend of mine, we were just bumming around Kenya for a bit. And we got to the airport in London when we landed. And there was a blackboard there just said, any Royal Marines, please report to this desk. And we're like, what's that about? And just all got recalled to the unit. But that was pretty good. You know, we kind of very quickly conned and bombed at 4-5 then down on the aircraft out to northern Iraq and on the ground within days. And I think, if I remember correctly, the Prime Minister wasn't even aware that we were boots on ground until someone asked the question in the House of Commons. Um, but that was a good experience, only a few months. Um, but yeah, just up in the mountains of northern Iraq and hooking up with the Peshmerga and getting them to come down and get their people back. But yeah, terrific time, really good. And that mission was to protect the Kurds, was it? Was it not? Yeah, that's right. They kind of all um, 
you know, they've been massacres um, under the Saddam Hussein regime. So they don't do what they always do. They go to the mountains and they hide. So we come into, I think the first place we come into is called Zaka, or kind of a, a decent sized town. Um, and we just, yeah, we, we kicked the secret police out. We kicked the Iraqi army out and stuff. And then we started getting these people back down from the hills. And I mean, they, yeah, they're living up in mountains above the snow line and all kind of stuff, you know, just tough, hardy people, but starving to death and suffering. So, yeah, we'd go up, we'd link up with the Peshmerga, the local militia, and then as a sort of a joint op, we'd bring these people back down and back into their homes. But some of it's pretty haunting, you know. We come into villages, maybe the size of the village I live in now, which might have like you know, 900, 1,000 people in the area, and it'd be deserted, you know, like a real Marie Celeste. You know, we'd be going house to house, you know, playing for booby traps. But you know, it's like people that just drop cups and saucers and disappear. And they'd only be like dogs walking the street. And you're just like, where did these people go? And then, they, you know, when you were talking to them, they'd say, wow, well, you know, the Iraqis came, took all the men over the age of 12 and buried them alive in the desert. And you're, just like, you're dealing with a complete different level of barbarism than you've ever encountered in your life. Yeah, the poor old Kurds, because they their territory spreads across different countries, doesn't it? So they're not. Yeah, this is yeah. this is why they're never recognised, and they get bashed by. I mean, Turkey send their youngsters, their young military out to give them a bit of, you know, I say a hide in is a probably an under, un, understatement, but they are they they're very kind people. From what f- 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 you know, I've spent a bit of time in Kurdistan. Um, did you get the dysentery when you were out there? I heard that, that dysentery was very bad. No, I had one little bout for a night, and, and that was about it, really. But yeah, <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen loads of books. <laughs> yeah. My so mate just said it, it yeah. just he said it killed him. <laughs> but yeah, the funny thing is, Chris, I was in we were in the field the whole time, but like about halfway through, the um, you know, headquarters said, Oh, we've taken over one of. The hotels in the mountains were going to get you up there for a night. You'll eat proper food and have a proper bed. And that's the only time I got the squirts was from Royal Marine chefs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I got dysentery on the way. I drove to drove to India once, and I think going through the it, it's it's when we start to eat the darling. I think in Pakistan you're fine up until um, Iran's all quite sort of fairly modern, or probably more modern than most people would feel <laughs> and i think the first time we ate dow off the side of the road it just started and then it just become a thing you had this and it just stayed with me for week, weeks yeah. my stomach wasn't right um yes so um how does one go i mean feel free to say what you're allowed to say james but what how, how did you enter special operations um I'd actually had a bit of an interest in it from the Northern Ireland tour I did with the Marines, Chris, because um, maybe like yourself, you, when we were over there, these two kind of long-haired, bearded guys came to our location and gave us a, a very vague brief on who they were. But basically they were saying, if you see anything interesting or when you stop someone and fill out the Charlie One vehicle um, report form, forward it to us if they're chatty or anything like that. Um now, these two guys didn't cover themselves in glory with our location, actually. There were, there were a couple of cowboys, which we, you know, became very apparent. But I never forgot that. I thought, you know, I'm cutting about Northern Ireland in a helicopter because it's unsafe to move in the roads, or, you know, multiples. I've got ECM to jam um, signals for bombs. And here's John and Charlie with beards and a Ford Sierra. And I remember it always stuck in my head. Like, what do you do here? You know, what, who, who are you guys? <laughs> And some years later, um, I got a brief at 4-5 Commando. You get the Special Forces brief then, these guys. And when they were speaking about what they did, I remember thinking, that's pretty fucking hardcore. Um, Sounds interesting. So I think I started looking into it seriously around 97. Um, And it'd be like anything. There's a whole routine for it. You know, you you go to your troop sergeant, you say, I'm interested in it. He talks to the company commander. He finds the dusty file and sort of blows it off and says, right, you've got to be fit. Um, you can't be a numpty, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so from there, the, the unit I chose to go um, and apply for, we had to go and do I think it was about a five-day kind of pre-assessment. There's a lot of fizz. I think you do fizz a couple of times a day. 
But in that five days, there was something like 70 or 80 tests, um, all sorts of physical, mental, uh, re- all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I remember even going through, I thought this is one of the most interesting things I've done. There's so many weird shit, but <laughs> it's really flicking my switch 100%. And I think on my, that pre-selection, because it was a tri-service, so there was there a couple of Marines, the paras, infantry, all sorts. I think we had about 35 or 40, and I think four of us kind of got through it. Mm. And then they loaded us onto the courses. So my course was in... 99 that's when i did my course and passed it from there now, it's changed a little bit now but back then i think it was about three and a half months worth of it um and it started with you know as you'd expect a lot of range work um a lot of unarmed combat and it was all because when you do deploy and you do work you're a two-man team a three-man team separated different cars whatever but you'll never have the big green machine with you you've got to learn how to be capable and you know, uh, helping your teammates out of really sticky situations when there's only two or three of you on the ground. So I passed the course, and when I'd finished it, I think we were supposed to have a couple of weeks leave or something, and I just got a phone call the next day saying, can you go out early? I was like, okay. So me and my friend went out to replace a couple of guys who (laughs) had had an altercation when they were drinking and unfortunately got sacked by the unit. So we got thrown in pretty much at the deep end, but... I kind of think sometimes that's it's the best way in a lot of things is, you, you know, you're in your feet away and, and you're running, you know, before you know it. Mm. I think I know that story. I think we've had someone else on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> that told us that one. Um, and is it, it's kind of, it's, I don't know if it's appropriate asking this question now, because as you get older, you second guess things a lot more than when you're young, don't you? Yeah. When we were young, we were a bit mental. We would have done anything that we were asked to do, wouldn't we? You know, yeah, that's what we signed up for. But when I look back now and think, when you hear about, was it Captain Nyrak? His legacy and and his, his demise kind of haunts the whole special operations community over there because he was one of the you know, the first kind of guys. Um, but yeah, but when you look at what he was doing and how he was doing it, you just say uh, insanity. How did he expect to ever carry that off for any length of time? Mm-hmm. But but he did, to, to, to be fair. But, you know, it was, he was always going to pay the piper at some point. Yeah, I mean, unless you're born over there and you've got connections and you can carry, you know, obviously you've got the accent and, even that, like the the look, I'm guessing it 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 you you're on a dodgy wicket, aren't you? Oh, massively, mate. You you can't pretend to that depth. It, it's impossible, you know. You your your cover story just wouldn't have enough depth. Uh, I mean, that's probably what undid him in the end. I'm not really sure, but I think he he probably got away with a lot of it because he was a bit of an unknown entity. They weren't quite sure who is this guy. What exactly is he? And he I think what did he say? He was Danny from Belfast and he would sing in the local bars around drum and tea and stuff in South Armagh. And I think he was just, they didn't quite know what box to put him in, but eventually I think they just made the decision that he's a bad and let's grab him and see what he's got to say. Mm. Yeah. I was in a, when I was um, working the door in Hong Kong, <laughs> some, I got in a conversation with one chap and he said, he said, um, You've been in the military. <laughs> I went, yeah. He said, I fucking hate the British military. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not in the military now, but you're still in the IRA though, obviously. So what's your fucking problem? <laughs> he went, oh yeah, you want a beer? <laughs> we, 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 went at, we went to a smashing party. <laughs> it was, I'll never forget it. But, um, yeah, funny times, and then other guys would come in, and they f- they just fucking hated you. Yeah, absolutely, just wouldn't even just fuck off, mate. Uh, you know, just like wouldn't even. And you're the bloody doorman. <laughs> it's, yeah, it was a funny situation. To uh, I think it was because the work on the new airport over there attracted. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, Irish traditionally, you know, being good at building stuff. Um, yes. What do you do with your nine? You carry a nine mil, I'm guessing, or I suppose you carry a whole 
range of stuff in the boot of the car, do you? Well, yeah, yeah, we certainly did. I don't think too much has changed there. But, but well, as you can imagine, yeah, you've got all plethora of stuff because you want close range weapons. You want for a bit of standoff because, again, in any eventuality, you've got to allow for the fact your your car might be immobilized, uh, crashed, or whatever. You have to leave it. So you've got to have enough um, stuff to keep yourself alive and support your teammates as well, or until another car or another person can sort of come in and get you. So it goes back to that whole thing about that self reliance. You've got to be you know, whatever the threat is, take it on, be comfortable with it and have enough arms and ammunition just to deal with it until you can get some support. Mm. I mean, it can become very rare. We had a chap that I worked with in, I won't say where, but worked <clears> with him in, in Plymouth. And and I, I have no idea why he was undercover over there, but he, he was, and he drove into an IRA checkpoint. What do they call them? Like illegal it's checkpoints? IBCPs, or, yeah. Yeah. And um, he realised uh, there's no going back, so he just pulled up, pulled his nine mil out, stepped out of the car, and just shot three of them dead. Uh, it's just, it's like <laughs> it really is like the stuff of films, isn't it? Um, well, I, I think that you know, obviously, a, a fairly cautious what I said, but the training itself really prepares you for it. So so our training instructors were SES. They, it was always an SES training guy, and then you pass their phase to allow you to progress in the course. Um, and I think that helped because they gave you that decision-making process for exactly that thing. Um, it's like any kind of training. When you're exposed to it more and more and more, it becomes reaction rather than, oh, my gosh, what do I do? Hang on. I know I can do this. Although so you're in a situation and it says, bang, I know what I do now. And there's that just – just confidence and it becomes a reaction rather than you know you looking through courses of action as the situation kind of escalates and stuff mm-hmm. but yeah yeah the training absolutely pre- prepared us for it 100 percent. can we ask what your hairiest moment was doing this james um i suppose over there not i wouldn't say over there was too bad um i, I, had, I had a few things there's a couple i can't talk about to, to be honest but mm. Um, I, I certainly had one where we had a guy, we were on a job, we were in a very, very tough area, um, and he was injured uh, really, really bad. And there was only a couple of us on the ground to deal with that when a crowd sort of started forming and he had to be Kazabak to hospital and all sorts of stuff. And I think the thing for me is everybody, every soldier of that era remembers the Woods and Howes case, you know, where these two hapless signalers got caught and ripped and then killed by the mob. Um, and so when any crowd situation, mob situation, that is just right in the back of the head there, you know, mm. uh, and being sort of one guy, two guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But again, it was dealt. Um, we didn't have to shoot anyone. It was a projection of strength and a projection of aggression um, until we, we got some support and got out kind of thing. Yeah. Cause I guess you'd call up the QR <clears throat> the local green army QRF, yeah. would you? Yeah. Unfortunately, again, they're always some distance away. That's the issue. But then that's how a training works. It's like you will you know, protect, fight, take over hard cover until they can get to you. So it's that self-reliance again. Um, and again, it's quite unique because you work in the green army, um, like I did as a Marine, um, you're part of a fire team, you're part of this, that you're always part of something. So this was a, a big sea change to be, you know, one or two guys, three guys, whatever. Yes, and when you're dealing, I guess, with a Green Army, Green Army friends at home is what I believe special ops refer to the regular army yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on, <clears throat> on the ground as opposed to the undercover. And, and you, you're you relying on their commander then, aren't you? And he's not on your level because he's probably some toffee officer that's <laughs> been, you know, stick... Because we didn't that... Um, was it was it Al uh, was it Al Slater wasn't it was killed uh, SAS trooper, um, I think he wor- he was over there he was over there with Andy McNabb and uh, uh, they were all over there at this well those two were over there at the same time I know because I've read I've read a few books on it and um, they called up the QRF and they refused to come out even though it was kind of like, well, you know, we need yeah. you guys now and uh, ended up with a, with Al being killed. Uh, it's yes, it's beyond. 
Yeah, and I, I think like anything, a QRF is only as good as the, the the people running it kind of thing. I've had good and bad. I've had an incident in Afghanistan where, again, the QRF just lifted off the ground without, you know, because they were going to miss a meal. <laughs> despite, despite the fact you know, they were in Kandahar, they could have had, you know, a boardwalk open nearly 18 hours a day for Pizza Hut, chicken wings or whatever. Yeah, so... Yeah, that showed me, you know, very, you know, when we were quite exposed to where we were, you know, the reliance on the QRF is, yeah, it's, it's not a given. <laughs> and can you tell us uh, other areas of operation? That- yeah, uh, and again, obviously, I'll, I'll be cautious because um, th- there's a lot of stuff I, I can talk about in general. So um, I went to Iraq, I went as part of Task Force Black. Don't, um, don't mention Cornwall. Who does? Up against the Corn- Cornwall Liberation Army, right? <laughs> uh, mum's, mum's the word. <laughs> we'll keep that one, Stu. <laughs> Sorry. Go yeah, on, James. Yeah, I went out to Iraq. Um, I was part of Task Force Black out there. So that was the Special Air Service, well, Special Forces mission um, in Baghdad in the area there. And basically, that was to, you know, this was kind of the, the rise of Al-Qaeda. You know, they were car bombing everywhere in the city, killing just hundreds of people every week. So I went out as part of that. Um, terrific. Just first time I'd worked with a special forces squadron and just seeing the energy and the drive of these guys was just an absolute yeah, a joy. I even, even after my six months, I tried to extend <laughs> and stay on. It was just felt great to be part of something where you were just wrapping up bad guys day after day after day. Really rewarding. And that was in conjunction with the Americans, was it not, Project Black? So, yeah, um, there was, I think the Americans next is, well, that's open source now, it was uh, Task Force Green, so that was Delta Force. Um, we, and I did a couple of things with them too, because sometimes stuff I'd be doing wouldn't be our target set. We had a very focused target set. And, you know, if I'd pick up something else, I'd be like, well, we wouldn't use that, but I'd pop next door to Delta, have a word with one of their team leaders, their team commanders, and they'd sometimes run with it and go and take it from there. Mm. And um, we should say a big shout out to Bernie, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. He's a good lad. Yes. We just refer to him as Operator Bernie on this show. <laughs> he's, he's massively popular, the, the chats that we, we've had. Like I said, said to you earlier, James, you know, the, a lot of people, that this is the first they're ever going to get to learn of this, this unique and... Uh, obviously secretive world so bernie thank you mate bernie's going to come back on the come back on the show soon really mate. good lad very good lad mm. good mate is there um what's it like working with the americans is it are they consummate professionals or are, are they a bit gung gung-ho or yeah i i think from my experience they have got so much better in the last decade because they've just been exposed to constant war they really have been exposed to constant war. And like you know, um, they don't do anything small. They, they do everything on an industrial level. So, for example, that support I gave to Task Force Black, there was me, one, two, two or three others. The equivalent for the Americans um, was like six, seven times that easy, you know. Um, and that's just them. They do everything on an industrial scale. You know, their special forces, JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, I think the SF guys refer to it as the Death Star (laughs) because it's just this huge machine that kind of fuses all the technology for hoovering up intelligence and then the action on the ground as well. Um, So some were good, some were bad. I remember, um, again, I'd worked with CIA, people like that as well. Um, And I remember being a little bit operationally embarrassed because I'd been – chasing this target very close to getting them. And the CIA guy kind of walks in and just said, ah, yeah, if you guys are interested in Abu, whatever, I've got him, he's here, he's driving. And this guy, I mean, the the car, the timings, the bodyguards, you know, everything you'd need to do a strike on him. And I remember thinking, you know, know, I've been chasing this guy for ages. How have you got him? Mm -hmm. Um, But what he did allow me to do was sit with his asset, his source, so I could debrief him. And I debriefed this asset, you know, saying, okay, where does he do? What does he drive? How many bodyguards? What do they carry? Da, 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 da. And then that, just that one question where I said, um, so when was the last time you saw him? Oh, well, um, 
he was there. But he would never say, I saw him. And I had to keep asking, keep asking. And it was the typical Middle Eastern, African thing. Oh, well, I haven't seen him, but my mate has. But he's relayed this whole thing over two days about this target as if he's eyes on the ground. And cut a long story short, it was all bullshit. It was a cousin of a friend and he'd come into the Americans. I don't know why they hadn't done the due diligence of you know, digging into it, get me some photos, do anything else. Yeah, but what was funny was the squadron commander at the time, he got that from the CIA and he came in, oh, James, yeah, you're lagging a bit, mate. Yanks are all over this. And you, know, you, you feel professionally Okay, now, but of course, then I got to go back and go look at nothing, <laughs> and we we wrapped up our target later on, so it was nice. But yeah, that showed me that you can be, you know, top tier level and still be crap at your job. But I've also worked with other Yanks in CIA and FBI who've been phenomenal, absolutely on their game. How many rounds have you fired in your life? Do you think? I mean, in anger? In, 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 uh, well, in anger, and what I was going to, I actually meant in training because uh, oh, okay. I'll, I'll bet it's a fair few. It's a lot in training. I mean, um, I, I think that's, that's the thing I noticed when I went to the, this, the, you know, the special duty, special operations unit was ammo was unlimited. And it was there because they just want, you know, th those weapons, those drills just to be there. Um, probably like you, when I was coming up in the court, it was exotic to fire a nine mil in 13 rounds. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. again, you'd go to America. I'd go to America with the Marines for an exchange, and they're, you know, shed loads of ammo. They just put it down the range nonstop. So, yeah, that was quite good when I went to special duties, was the fact that tons of ammo, tons of training, yeah, lots of it. Mm. You do realize under the way the government's going, you, you're going to get a bill for all of this ammo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pollution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and did you, uh, one of my favorite weapons ever was the SMG, the submachine, oh, yeah. shit, the Sterling submachine. Yeah, I just loved it. And I lo the reason I loved it is you, you feel the working parts coming back. Okay. And it, and it was really quite, you know, there wasn't a huge kick, but I love the SLR as well. Um, over 300 meters was just incredible, especially as it didn't have an optical sight. It's mm -hmm. way more accurate than, than the SA-80, which did have a optical yeah. sight. Um, nine mil was a pain in the ass because I carried one on ship for a year. And you, you literally had to sleep with it under your pillow because you, 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 you knew what would happen if you lost it. <laughs> it's like, well, I remember once we, we had the, the um, ship's Christmas piss up. And you remember how much we used to drink. It was just criminal cr criminal man and i got up on stage with edwin star soul sensation yeah, yeah and uh he said war who and then he handed me the microphone and i said what is it good for <laughs> absolutely nothing <Class>. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was just but the the next day the next day we had uh, we we had some we were doing some drills you know I don't know imagine that a, you know some terrorist has breached the gangway on the ship and he's coming down and we had we had some let's say some special things on uh, on on yeah. on uh, invincible and as we were standing and getting briefed by our corporal I fucking dropped my nine mil on the deck you can imagine the weight of a nine mil clattering on a steel deck it and everyone just turned like that <laughs> it's like yeah all right all right all right i was fucking shit faced still <laughs> <laughs> yes well, we a guy i remember with a i think i was a sig actually a nine mil again but we were on the range uh, in northern ireland and our ceo when that would come down and he's a really good kind of cracking guy and he liked coming down with the guys, having a shoot and talking to you individually and stuff. So again, you know, we finished the shoot, we're all lined up, you know, for inspection, port arms, Cleary Springs, boom, big bang. And when we all looked and everybody does what you said, wherever the bang is, the crowd goes, woof, and just leaves this lone individual. And here's the CEO with a puff of smoke between his feet <laughs> and this operator going, I'm really sorry. <laughs> like, I mean, the worst place, worst time having in the... We had loads in Belfast, not, <clears throat> I, I mean, as a, not 
not just the Marines, but all the people coming in and out of the yeah. of, of of the base. Um, one chap some army guy undercover he driven in in his car he went into the naffy and thought he was clearing his nine mil before he went in and obviously forgot to take the magazine off drilled a hole in a tarmac <laughs> looked around thought no one had saw him so he just went 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 in and got a pint <laughs> and of course that caught up with him but yeah it, for me, it was a religious thing. You took the magazine off. Oh, yeah. You took it off and you check your chamber. And then, okay, then, you know, E Springs or whatever. That, that, that was just it. But people would go up to the loading bay and go, ch -ch -ch. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, where is your head to do? I know. But it, you're, you're paranoid about it. Utterly paranoid about it. We had one on the, I think it was up the, bottom of the yard oh, is it crumlin road i can't mm. remember um again someone shot the bloody f a few days earlier someone in the back of one of the um it was a it was an, a, an army guy again that was on patrol with us in one of the the jeeps can't remember we're calling it not a pig but the the, the land rover type it's thing and, um or was it a, no it, was it a pig it might have been a pig anyway and he ended in the back and the only reason he didn't kill the driver is there was a, was it PRC radio? We used to call oh, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a radio behind us. We took the radio out. And then one of, one of my mates ended on the Kremlin road. And it was funny because you obviously didn't, we thought it was a contact. And I remember seeing like grown men panic. I just took, took up a fire position. I'm looking around. There's guys like, you could see that they were just panicking. It was, uh, yeah, quite, quite in interesting to see how highly trained individuals can <laughs> can react when they're not expecting something. Yes. Um, so let's talk about Africa because you've got quite a connection with, with. Do you know James Glancy? I know the name. Yeah. 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 James was a. Um, um, I'll, I'll just say he was a Royal Marines officer, and we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Yeah. Um, but he's uh, in, he's done a lot of uh, wildlife programs and all, a lot of a lot of conservation work as well. He came on he came on the show. Africa's an amazing an amazing place. Full full stop. When you're there and you think Mother Africa, and you you can see why. Hey, yeah, I am. Um... When I was a kid, you know, I used to do odd jobs and stuff. I, I grew up in Australia when I was younger. Um, so I used to do odd jobs for, like, neighbours and stuff, do their gardens. And this um, one old couple, I always remember they had, like, rows of National Geographics. And I'd sort of pick one up. And when they saw me, they didn't encourage me, just take it home, read it. And, of course, National Geographics from the 60s and 70s were all about Africa. And I swore to myself, I'm going to go there one day. I'm going to see this. I'm going to see gorillas and lions and everything else so yeah the first opportunity i had it i did um started out in east africa in kenya tanzania and then over the years you know down to morocco and i used to do a lot of surfing as well still do but not so much so surfing morocco and just living a bit hand to mouth on the coast just terrific absolutely terrific did you see any sharks when you were surfing there no not there um saw some in south africa but not not up in the moroccan coast now mm. Where I taught, uh, I taught street kids in Mozambique, a place called N Nicala Porto. Well, oh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, it was actually a biro, you know, a village outside of Nicala. And and uh, just before I got there, one of the ki the kids, we used to go swimming every day if we could. There was a reef there, and it was just incredible. We'd we'd go fishing, and and there were there were guys there, uh, fishermen, spear fishermen. And all their kit was homemade. Even their even their mask, they made it out of like an old car tire wrapped around yeah. a piece of glass. And I remember the guy he let me have a go of his spear gun one day. And 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 as I went to jump, and he went no, and he threw the spear gun in first. He said, "You always, you know, let it sink to the bottom, and then you swim down and pick, just so you don't okay. shoot shoot yourself." <laughs> it was it was just incredible. But one of the kids got taken mm -hmm. by a sh taken by a shark. Just before I got there, yeah, I um. So you know, Palma up in northern Mozambique. I was kind of mm. 
Uh, I, I did an oil and gas project where they basically, you know, went into the jungle and built a city and an international airport and everything else. Um, but it was based just, just south of Palma. So I was based up there for a bit. Then I went down to Pemba um, and, you know, lived the life of Riley at a hotel and stuff like that. But, yeah, the, as you say there, I, I couldn't – every morning at dawn, you'd see the locals walk to the beach with a homemade mask. And, and it was kind of like a, a, a tiered system. You know, the lowest of the low didn't even have a mask. He'd have a net. And he'd just swim out, take big breaths and collect shellfish. And then the guy above him had a homemade mask. And the guy above him, who was a bit wealthier, he had a homemade mask and a spear gun. And then the rich guy had a dugout. But they would come back yeah, like yeah. tuna and these giant fish. I was just amazed. Yeah, we, we could walk along the beach in, in the afternoon and they'd have their catch laid out on the beach. Yeah. Sometimes they got lucky. These little dugout canoes with a single line and they'd catch a whole shoal of tuna or a good, good part of a shoal. Crazy, man. Yes. It was so simple. I mean... For friends at home, when you, I don't know what it's like now. I, I would imagine Mozambique should be one of the hottest tourist spots on the planet because it was stunningly beautiful. Yeah. It was stunning. The only drawback there, if you're a Westerner, was there were no toilets. So everybody knit behind a tree. So there was a permanent, like, yeah. whiff of Chima was the, uh, it's like this Samalina. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Samalina that the Americans obviously had some, deal they'd supply and all the kids ate was chima with a tiny dribble of like goat broth on top and they had one one meal a day and that was it and and um i remember when we got off the plane and then we got a lift in a land rover by someone who dropped us at a bus stop and we got this chicken bus to nakala and as you left the kind of urban area of the airport it's just nothing just bush and scrub and savannah and then suddenly you see mud huts with people walking with a pot yeah it was just beyond belief james you know just it was just like tar the when you watch tarzan as a kid <laughs> um just absolutely incredible one of the best it is yeah it, it is almost like time travel because you're hitting these places where there's no development, there's no electricity, there's no water other than what's in a stream. And people still live a very subsistence level existence doing it, you know? Mm, yes. <clears throat> and have you have you done anti-poaching stuff? I did, mate, yeah. I went out to West Africa um, to work there um, for conservation charities. So I, I was doing counterterrorism work and we were approached by a conservation charity. We said, look, we think you could take that model and apply it in a training mentoring capacity to local rangers because these national parks in Cameroon and Benin uh, are getting absolutely destroyed by poaching. So I, I went out to Benin first and had a look and just terrific work with a couple of French zoologists. Um, and again, you know, when I was, I, I, you know, I'm, we're not really doing this for money. I'm getting paid to do it, but you, you know, you take a big chunk away because you think, well, this is more for helping rather than anything else. But, you know, you say to these zoologists, I say, so what about accommodation? They go, oh, we've got a really good hotel. Now I'd never worked with zoologists before. So to me, a hotel is a hotel. So we end up in the very North of Benyon, you know, quite a rough a rural area, but initially the hotel looks like a hotel. There's all these white rondevels with a thatch. But as I'm walking towards it, I look and I'm like, okay, so my door is about this much off the floor. You just push it and it opens. There's no lock. And as I look to my bed, it's still got the shape of the person before me in it on the yellow sheets and the home suite's just a pipe. But it's like, hey, it's, you know, it's absolutely fine. But uh, again, for me, the reward was just being among wildlife. I love wildlife. So we get into this national park, get out and food. And we track lion or and you know with elephant charges and stuff. It's just every boy's dream. Absolutely amazing. And it's a <clears throat> sad situation, James, isn't it? Because the Chinese obviously will pour an awful lot of money into buying these animal parts. And it's no, there's no like, I mean, it, it's different. I mean, even when I I've lived in China, I've lived in Hong Kong. It, it's very different. I remember my business partner in Hong Kong, he was a 
Hong Kong Chinese guy and he lifted up the newspaper one day and on the front page was a picture of someone getting pulled out of the surf with all their legs ripped to ribbons by a shark. And me coming from conservative England, even though obviously, you know, we had travelled quite a bit by that stage, but I just, my jaw dropped and I said, is that kind of picture just n normal here? He went, oh yeah, Hong Kong people, very animal. <laughs> like that, right? And the point I'm getting the point I'm getting to, James, is that you know, it we've got all our morals and our yeah. etiquette and our codes of conduct here and we don't hurt animals and but it, it it's it it's a different part of the world. And I, I'd imagine they have no qualms, you know, taking a bit of rhino horn aphrodisiac and not it it you know um but that was the, that was the main difficulty I had is because you know you can you know you can do all, all the kind of poaching programs you want at the grassroots level to catch these guys, but at the top international level, you know, you got these Chinese officials bribing. I mean, the top level of government to assist. We, I mean, we did some good work and we stopped quite a lot. We caught quite a lot. But I can also remember getting a call one night from one of the rangers I was mentoring with. And he said, you need to come quick, you need to come quick. And I said, he's in, I won't mention his position, but a minister, a government minister, drove into the National Park at night with a couple of people with him and just going to go kill elephants, get the tusks, get them out. And these guys aren't going to fight against that level of corruption. They can't, you know. It's, they just don't have the, the power. They're not empowered enough to do it. They're just low-level rangers, you know, running around with a pair of trainers and five bullets and a, and a gun. And, you know, a national level minister and his goons turn up to go and slot elephants. Um, so we did, we linked up with Interpol um, and a lot of those agencies to, again, just kind of, you know, front end, back end, try and smash the two of them. But it's almost impossible with the Chinese. They're, they're, they've been doing this for so long. They're very, very good at what they do. Yeah, I bet they can pay for some expensive helicopter operations and stuff, can't they? And yeah, just, and they're gonna, as you said, they're going to qualms. There's no moral. Uh, red line that they will stop at it's just it's business that's it mm. yeah i mean uh, when I, I was in um Guan, Guan, guangzhou i think it was and uh walking through the city and these <clears throat> women were just running up to you with these babies and the babies were all like on valium and they borrow the baby. The babies get like rent. You know, uh, yeah. you 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 hire a baby for the day, give it a Valium, so it's just, and then then you just run up to anybody you think's going to sort of give you money. And I I thought that was bad. I was doing a business presentation uh, one night, and I happened to mention that I'd been in Hong Kong and I was going back there for business, and and to uh, an elderly couple, or I say probably my age now, but when I was young, they were this, uh, they were older and they, they come up to me after my president and said, you just said you had a great time in China. And I was, uh, yeah, they said, we, we saw kids like crippled and chained to railings with begging, but, and folks, we're not, having a go at the Chinese, it was just highlighting the, you know, the, the, the just, and obviously this isn't everyone in China. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure the majority of Chinese people are loving and, and, and caring, but this was a, you know, this was a phenomenon. You just think those poor animals don't, they, I mean, how many species are extinct now? And you know, the, it's, you kind of would have thought that in the, the day and age of science proving you know, that rhino horns essentially keratin, which is essentially fingernails, you know, if you want to boil it down mm. to its basic, will have no effect whatsoever in your virility or your libido or anything. But it, that, that kind of folk medicine uh, superstition still persists, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's a shame because, you know, when we were poaching, as much of it was about recognising you, you can't just, like, arrest and lock everybody up who poaches because some of these people poach for bushmeat. They live on bushmeat as locals. So, you know, you, what we did was implement a buy-in. So, like, come and work with us. Get a small salary for working with us rather than going out and shooting chimpanzees or some of the rarer animals. And, again, that was good. But at the top end, you were still getting, you know, why aren't we getting elephant tusk out? Why aren't we getting rhino horn out? <clears throat> and um, a lot of the guys over there, 
they're French, you know, because they, uh, Benny and Cameron were French colonies. And these old French guys stayed on, you know, and they love living there. Mm-hmm. And they almost self-protect the areas just because, I mean, it, I don't know, I guess it's like an English expat living somewhere he adores. And he just say, oh, this is my home, I'll, I'll protect it. So these French guys were actually doing a pretty good job. Crazy. You know, they'd be shot at, and, you know, one of them had a grenade thrown at him at some point. But still, you know, goes out, does a little patrol in his little Land Rover. And, yeah, amazing. It's funny in Mozambique, you occasionally you'd meet a, a someone of Portuguese origin that had obviously stayed behind after the civil wars and the and the colonial wars and all all the horrors they've been through, and you'd think this person was European, so you'd sort of, <laughs> you know, and then when they spoke, the way they spoke, when all their mat they spoke obviously fluent Macaw, their mannerisms were just like a, a it was. It, it, it is in, in just that whole colonial thing is yeah. fascinating. Um, fascinating in itself. James, I heard that they, for a while they were, they were chopping the right, they were chainsawing off the rhino's horn in an attempt to protect it by taking the horn off it. And then the poachers were just killing it anyway, because they didn't want to waste time tracking an animal only to find that it didn't. Yeah. It did, didn't have a horn. That's 100% right, mate. They were doing that. Um, and again, it was, <laughs> you see it everywhere, don't you? Law enforcement or something comes up with a, a mitigation measure and the bad guys find something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really sad, but that happened. They were taking the horns off them. Um, and again, the poachers, initially we thought it was bad temper. You know, you find a carcass of, of an animal that was killed. You just think, that's oh, frustration. But you were right. We got the intelligence back that said, no, just like, we'll kill it. It was, what's the point of tracking it and then finding that? So you're like, did we stop that now? Because, you know, and what was the other thing? They didn't do it in my area. I think it was East Africa. They started dyeing the horns this purple. And I can't remember what they dyed it with, but it was pretty permanent. And the, the hope was nobody's going to want a purple horn. Um, I, I don't really know how far along they got with that one. But, mm. yeah, cra- crazy the lengths people have to go to just to protect something like a rhino or an elephant. Did you have any hairy moments doing this work? Yeah, mostly from animals. <laughs> but I had two amazing zoologists. So um, one of the women, she's like the, the preeminent elephant expert. And I'd been in South Africa with elephants where they, they'll walk past you. Um, but when I was in West Africa, a lot of the times they charge us. If they seen us, they would just charge. So she explained to me how you can differentiate between a fake, a mock charge and a real charge. And with a bull, it, it, a lot of the times in a bull charge, it's a mock charge. He knows who he is. He knows what he is. And it's quite easy to tell when they get to a certain distance. But it's that bolting moment of holding your ground <laughs> and not running. Calves, are, uh, sorry, not calves, the, the females, they, yeah, they'll pretty much keep coming. Mm. And I saw that in West Africa a lot. We'd go, no, nah, it's a mock, it's a mock, it's, a, it's real, and off you go. But as she said, because they are poached so bad, their mentality for humans is, just keep, to get them because they're here to kill us. In the reserves in South Africa, where I was, they, they weren't poached. So we're just part of the landscape. So it was absolutely fine, yeah. Yeah, I was in Kruger National Park <clears> once <throat> and about 30 elephant just walked right, <laughs> right past. Did you, have you, uh, did you see many um, puff adders and black mambas? Yeah, I've seen puff adders. Um, I'm not sure I've seen a black mamba or something similar, but yeah, puff adders. And I mean, they're a... That's something you do not want to be messing about with at all. Yeah, you you saw a lot of lot of people in Mozambique with one leg, and that was from the puff adder. My my roommate Jolt, Hungarian chap, um, he come out of our building one night and he come running back in, Chris, quick, quick, and we went out and just right at the bottom of the step was a puff adder, and they the, the reason they're so dangerous is not just the poison, but they don't move away. They, yeah. they, you know, they just they they just stay there, and the Africans, of course, just want to kill. I'll say, of course, um, but you know, they it's in their culture to hate these, hate any form of snake. So, any time a snake appeared, that, that the Mozambique can just look for a stick immediately to <laughs> to. Um, and the funny thing is, the black mamba's not black; it's green or green, brown, yeah, green, wow. greeny yeah. brown. Yeah, and they can rear up. 
like a cobra. They can yeah. really rear up, look around, and bang, then they're off again. And they're aggressive too, you know. I mean, I grew up in Australia. I was pretty comfortable with snakes. We, we didn't catch them sometimes. But, um, yeah, there's some species you don't mess about with. And, yeah, the mambas and the puff adders. And as you say, the puff adders, most, most snakes, if you're walking and the vibration on the ground, they'll just go away. The puff adders don't, and that's the problem. You know, your boot's on it before you know it, and then it's biting. Mm. I had a, a guide I worked with, um, terrific guide, who was hugely knowledgeable. We'd come back, um, we'd been out most of the day, so we got back at dark, and he was knackered. He'd been out since like four in the morning guiding. So he went into his room. <clears throat> He'd foolishly left his top window open in his little sort of cabin he had. Quick shower, lay in his bed, was asleep, and he woke up, you know, abruptly, that he had a dream that a snake had gone between his belly and his mattress. And as he lay there, he couldn't feel anything, but he went, it just felt so real. So he got up, put the light on, lifted his mattress, a good seven-foot cobra, spitting cobra under his bed. And, of course, the minute he lifted the mattress, this thing's up, <laughs> spitting at him, and he's in this tiny sort of confined space. Just like, oh, horrendous. <laughs> yes. Oh, James, let's talk about your writing because that, for all your adventures that you've told us, I know from experience, writing is like the toughest. The, you know, it's kind of funny. It's it's easier to get a green berry with the Royal Marines commandos than it is to write a book. I mean, statistically, <laughs> um, because it's a process, isn't it? Were you like me? I I actually did English GCSE in the Marines. Had to teach myself. Um, mm -hmm. I did a correspondence course rather. So when I write my first book, I I kind of had a knack for the writing, the kind of mm -hmm. way it the way it flowed and the description and being a bit I like to be a bit sort of, you know, a bit quirky with my writing. Probably uh, having read On the Road by Kerouac and, and yeah, yeah. um Hunter S. Thompson and this sort 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 of thing. I I like my writing to represent me is what I'm trying yeah, to say, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but my God, took me five months to write 240,000 words, which is basically two books, if yeah, not yeah. three. And then it took me 18 more months to learn how to edit. I didn't know what a comma was, believe it or not. Everyone at home is going, oh, a comma is when you, no, it's not, when, it's not when you pause. I mean, it can be, but, yeah. you know. There's six, is it five yeah, rules for a comma? Yeah, yeah. Six rules for a comma and, and and you have to learn them. And it's only when you've learned them, then you can decide, actually, I my last, I mean, for example, my last book, uh, uh, State of Mind, the story of when I ran the length for the UK, I, I went for minimal punctuation. Mm -hmm. I just looked at all these traditional colons and I thought, now, nah, if I don't need it and it doesn't look stupid, I'm, uh, and that in itself, uh, you have to look, you know, you have to yeah. learn. So, so how, how, how was your writing journey, James? Um, I'd, I'd always read, um, which is quite unique for guys. I mean, a lot of, a lot of men blogs, we, we don't read as a rule, but I did um, ever since I was a kid, a bit of escapism, I think. Um, and I think I, you know, reading everything, but when I was getting sort of, my theories and stuff. You'd read a book and you'd literally go, I could do better than that and throw it away. And I think one day I just kind of thought, you know what? Well, yeah, maybe I could do better than that, but I'll never know unless I try. So like you said, it's like, well, how do you start? I mean, how do you start writing a book when you make the decision? And I'm like, well, okay, I'll just, I'll just start writing in Word, a Word document and see where it goes. So I had a story it's sort of in my head and I worked with an American guy, um, Western Oaks, cracking guy. Worked with him in America, in um, Europe, doing stuff. Um, and he was a published author in the states, and he won the Bram Stoker Award for best horror. So he's he's, he's a really you know qualified guy to speak to. So I gave him my story. I said, "Would you mind looking at it?" And the one thing I like about Weston, he is brutally honest. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're his friend; he'll he'll tell you because mm -hmm. he said that's how it should be. So I kind of weighed, weighed. He came back. He went mate, you can really write. He said, I will give this to my agent because I think she needs first bite of it, blah, blah, blah. And at that point, you just think, oh, that's cool. I'll just wait for Hollywood to knock on the door. Me and Tom Cruise will be out for cigars and brandies. Um, and it didn't take off at all. Just didn't work. 
Um, so I kind of was speaking to this agent and said, what's wrong with it? She said, well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just nobody really wants it because, you know, they've got this, they want to buy, they've got crime, they want to buy our thrillers. It's not really fitting it. So again, I was like, right, okay, well, I've got a guy, an expert who tells me I can write. I've got an agent who tells me it's a book, it can sell, but it's not. So I kind of fell back to what I know, which is, you know, military thriller kind of things. And um, so my first novel, I'd had this idea for quite a while, and it comes back to our backgrounds where you deploy to foreign theatres in conflict or war, and the other side don't use the rules. And this was about using kids as suicide bombers. And certainly with 4-5 Commando, there was a really terrible, sad story where they couldn't shoot a child who was bringing a suicide bomb and some guys died. And I always remember that thinking, you know, how that messes with people's heads. So my first novel I wrote with a kind of Marine suffering from PTSD, who then off to the West Coast of Scotland. But of course, the MPs are looking for him. So a good kind of survival, recovery and the redemption of nature kind of story did really well. And I thought, right, OK, I, I know what to write about now and what sells. And this is what people want to read from me rather than, than what I've tried before. Mm -hmm. So I'm now six novels in. Yeah, six novels in. And the last novel um, I've done, A Day Ahead of the Devil, that focuses pretty much on the debacle of the evacuation of Afghanistan and Kabul. And again, I've written it from different perspectives where you know I've got a, an SAS team out there trying to recover MI6 assets to get them out. I've got a Taliban commander who's absolutely appalled that the Americans are holding the airport when they've taken the city and an Afghan special forces team. Yeah, so for um, a couple of years, I was mentoring Afghan special forces and it was two. So you had Afghan commandos and another unit called the Karihas, which is their tier one um, kind of unit. And they were a dream to work with. Um, you know, these guys were out doing the job day in, day out. They were terrific. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of ring fenced from all the corruption and, you know, the waste of money that was the rest of the Afghan military because the American JSOC just held these guys. But even two months ago, I was still getting messages from some of these guys in Afghanistan trapped in under the Taliban regime, trying to escape with their families. So this novel really was about, you know, that kind of thing in my head of, you know, tell these guys story, look at what they're going through and put it from there. But yeah, so I released that a month ago, I think, and that's doing crack and really well. Some brilliant reviews from it coming in as well. And James, sorry to clarify, do you, oh, is this all fiction? I know all it's, fiction, I, I know yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. A, it, the old fiction. We came to writing, didn't we? Just as writing went, as, as reading went like that, because everyone, <laughs> you know, yeah. everyone's lost their attention span now and people, I've, 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 I, like you, I used to escape into a book. I used to make myself a glass of hot orange squash, right? That's because, you know, probably a bit young to start on the beer at seven, but that was my thing. Hot orange squash. I climb into bed and I get my Eni blighting out or whatever. And I, and, and, and then I progressed onto the Willard Price adventure series, which was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. All about Africa and South Sea adventure and Amazon. And, and it's why I've loved traveling so much. But um, of course, it's a, it's a very different market now. You were probably like me, and like most people I speak to, you think if you write a book, that's it, you're a millionaire. <laughs> you get a publishing deal. <laughs> yeah. You're, and and I found the whole publishing thing really hard because you know your books are very personal to you. I don't mind a good editor. That's not a issue. But one editor had he wanted to cut all my bootneck humor out, and I'm like, no, that's yeah. That's funny to it. Oh, is it? And and in the end, I started my own publishing company and I just took control of all of it because I'm, I, I don't want to refer to publishing houses as criminals, but <laughs> bloody hell. In the end, I was getting like 25 quid every six months. Yeah. <laughs> and they want to sit on your Kindle, right? So, you know, Kindle, they don't have to do anything. There's not, not even a physical copy to warehouse yeah. or anything. And they, they want to give you like, I don't know, 10% or and, and they're going to sit on that for the rest of your life. I'm like, nah, nah, not doing it. 
Well, that's interesting. We, we've got exactly the same model, Chris. I did exactly the same thing for exactly the same reason. When I was picked up by a publisher, again, it was, yeah, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. The editing, like, yeah, I wasn't too fussed about it. It was okay. It was the, the royalties and the, um, the rights and everything else. And again, I, I think they were offering like, I don't know, 15p per book sold or something and everything else. And they said, you'll still have to do the marketing and the advertising. I was like, well, what do you do? And they said, well, we build the book. And, and that is a big thing. Don't get me wrong. Cover art, um, formatting, everything else. But the same as you, I was like, there must be another way. And yeah, I did exactly the same, mate, for the same reasons mm. and the control, because there's, I've got a couple of author mates who are in traditional publishing houses. And I mean, they're waiting roughly two years from when they submit a manuscript to when that book comes to market. Mm. And the book's not getting any better in those two years. It's just in a queue because yeah. there's other, you know, the publishing house has other authors in front of it. Yes. I learned, I learned everything, James. I've become a really good editor, believe it or not. Yeah. I, I just, just, I can just look at the, and I know what needs to be taken out or, or, or what unnecessary part. I just, it just, I think if you've, got that knack from the start you improve upon it but if you haven't got the skill from the start you're only ever going to be a mediocre sort yeah. of my first fiction um <clears throat> I don't know if i've got a copy here some well there'll be a oh no in fact there won't there won't be uh, my first book of fiction was called the drift mm -hmm. it's about a former uh former navy seal called hans larsen and uh, it's it's something like five stories intertwined, but I did it so well, a lot of people aren't smart enough to, <laughs> to, to get it. So they read it and they're like, it's like five stories that went nowhere. It's like, no, this, it's each one resolves into, you know, like the mainstream narrative, if you know what yes. I mean. Each, each one comes back to it in such a clever way. Um, but the the interesting was I wrote the second book. It's called The Trade. And oh my gosh, I'll admit the first one is a bit quirky. I mean, I didn't I didn't want this macho hero. I wanted a dad that loved his daughter. I wanted a um, they're going through grief, and how does that affect you know loss of their mother? And I wanted a hard drinker because I was a hard. <laughs> yeah drink, you know drink back back in the day and i wanted a hard man as well because we've met hard men haven't we you know there's some people yeah. that are just fearlessness is just i wanted a man's man you know what i mean someone that will do anything for his little girl so it but the second one i uh, called the trade it's all about um the trade in children but it's not you know that's the theme theme anyway. Um, but oh my God, James, it was, it's so much better. You can see from the reviews because it's more of a, a linear, you know, it's a, it's one, yeah. I think, I, I think there might be a couple of backstory things going on in, in it, but it's just, it reads so well. I mean, I should read it myself because it's so good. <laughs> I, I think as well, Chris, um, I, I think I find that readers, they kind of like um, a very, well, not everybody, but the bulk of my readers kind of like a, a start, middle and end, and they want everything wrapped up and they want that resolution. So like you, my main characters, they're never superheroes because I think I, I don't like that. If I'm reading a book about, I don't know, an ex-Special Forces guy and, you know, he's shot seven times but still, you know, runs 10 miles and, you know, like, oh, come on. You know, I can suspend belief to a degree. Mm -hmm. So like you, I, I tend to put a lot more human failings and characteristics in the guys or the girls I write about. But I make sure, you know, by the end, all these little narratives are wrapped or, you know, the bad guys have got their comeuppance, but not again in an obvious way. I like to, you know, draw it out and have a bit of, what would you call it, karmic kind of interventions. Yeah, stuff like that. But readers, I think they like that. I think they, if they start investing in a story, at the end of the story, they want that resolution. Like, oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's great. Got him. Thank goodness. Mm. Yeah. The thing I was really proud of myself about is a couple of things, really. First off, I had to 
create a lot of stuff because I, I mean, I'm not like you, James. I haven't been in that field. I, I know my marine stuff, obviously. So I had to, you know, how would a Navy SEAL be in this situation? What what is CI? You, uh, you know, how how and and the second thing, oh, for example, I thought, right, software, if you wanted to infiltrate someone's computer what do you call it like a vault you know like mal- malware yeah. but but from an intelligence perspective i thought right what if you sent an email and there's an attachment in the email and if they click on it it downloads something you don't know to your computer and then it tracks your keyboard so everything that you type is then all you know go into a th- well bloody hell that's only <laughs> I, I read the other day that's quite an yeah. i invented that folks <laughs> I want paying, right? <laughs> and and the other thing is is my twists are you're never gonna get it. You're never gonna get it. The twists are, are it's got to be a twi- at the end. The person that you think is like the enemy, they was undercover all along. Yeah, you know this sort of yeah, 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 this, yes. Yeah. Um, but that I think readers love that stuff. They love being wrong footed and like oh. I thought I had him there, but yeah, they do really enjoy it, man. Yeah. I like to get back to it. I mean, some people are just happy to write fiction, aren't they? And I think I <laughs> could write 500 words in the morning and then, then, uh, you know, take the rest of the day off quite, quite happily. <laughs> um, James, we'll put all your book links below. So oh, I appreciate that. Man. Yeah. yeah. And friends at home, I was reading one of James books earlier, is it the sins of the father? Yeah. James, it's good. <laughs> Just right from the start, you can see this is someone that's been on the inside because you would never, the opening chapter, you'd never think that is how the intelligence community could operate. It's just mind, mind blown. So, so yeah, treat yourselves. The link is below. James, is there anything else you'd like to say before we before we wrap this one up? No, mate. Um, really, really grateful for the opportunity, Chris. How really good and enjoyed that. I've not done many podcasts, but I've enjoyed this. It's been more like a conversation, and uh, that has been good fun. Mate, really appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. No, no, no problem. I, ho- I hope this um, is the start of your podcast uh, journey. Did a podcast recently with to- to- Toby Toby Guttridge, I think I pronounced his surname right. He was an SBS operator and he got shot through the spine. Oh, another guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and it's just great to see that after he came on the show, he he it, it's like he's just taken off. And uh, yes, it's good. It's good to be able to help in uh, in some way. Nah, and um, let's just say another thank you to Bernie again. Thank you. Bernie, really, really kind for putting James and I in touch. James, you're welcome back anytime. Um, it's been a great chat. Absolutely loved it. I feel like I could... Um, really, Chris, really appreciate yeah, it. I feel like I could be an operator now and I could protect animals. <laughs> and now my writing's going to be even better. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff, mate. James, stay stay on the line. But to everyone at home, thank you to James, to all of you at home. Big, big love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you could like and subscribe, that would really appreciate it. And click the notifications bell. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.